Our immune system helps protect us from infectious disease. When it's weakened, we're more vulnerable to illness. So if genetically altered foods can affect rats in this way, could they possibly have long-term effects on humans too? When he was asked to speak on television, he had enormous pressure. He was one of the few people on earth that realized that the GM crops on the market might be causing all that damage in the gut and in the brain and in the organs of the entire population. And so with permission from his director, he was interviewed and then he was a hero for about two days at the Rowett Institute. The director praised his work, took over all the press work, put out his own press release, praising it as world-class research. And then the two phone calls allegedly placed from the UK Prime Minister's office forwarded to the, through the receptionist to the director. The next morning, Arpad Pustai was fired after 35 years and silenced with threats of a lawsuit. Uh, it is only when we think there was political pressure coming from the top that uh, the situation changed. And then the director, to save his own skin, decided that uh, um, the best way to deal with the situation, A, to destroy me, uh, B, to make me uh, shut up, so they, they invoked the contract uh, that I, whatever they did say on uh, TV and radio and re wrote in the newspapers, I could not deny it. I could not correct it. I couldn't say what was the, the real situation. And then we looked at the uh, submissions uh, of applications by the biotech companies uh, for those products which were already eating. And we found out that they were flimsy, they were uh, not uh, scientifically uh, well founded, and certainly not, uh, the, um, uh, the, the work which was uh, reported in them did not uh, compare well at all with our very extensive studies. He said, it was a turning point in my life. He said, Jeffrey, well, I realized what I was doing and what they were doing was diametrically opposed. I was doing safety studies. They were doing as little as possible to get their foods on the market as quickly as possible. So the turning point in his life was realizing that there were other scientists in the world who were not taking care of the health of the world, were not treating science properly. You see, he's, he's on the top level of the world. He expects other scientists to do so. So more than being fired from his job, more than, than these shocking moments in his life, his greatest shock was to discover that there was this whole world of scientists that would basically allow foods on the market for economic purposes. Washington. Today, a group of consumers and environmental organizations submitted a lawsuit against the Food and Drug Administration in Washington, demanding the enforcement of health safety tests and labeling of genetically modified foods. So what we have here is uh, 60,000 pages of documents, of internal documents of FDA uh, in these boxes here on what happened when they suppressed their science about GMOs. We, uh, going through these documents, we've come up with, um, yeah, here, we've come up with really the central documents that really demonstrate this, this suppression. It's really uh, quite remarkable. Uh, number of documents here, you see some of the major scientists at FDA saying these GMO crops are very different. So this is early on, this is the very beginning of the regulation of genetically engineered food in the United States. Scientist after scientist says these genetically engineered foods are not equivalent, not substantially equivalent to conventional food. And that, of course, that was the position that the industry wanted. There's nothing different here. They said, oh no, it's very different. Different proteins, viruses, different organisms inside these foods that create unique health risks. Here we see unique toxicity. They could, these foods could be toxic. 
You know, there's one document in here that I think is especially important that really shows this history probably better uh, than any other. And this had to do with their compliance in looking at the studies. And here's what the FDA scientists, their own scientists said, and I think it's on page 18,777, yeah, right here. And they say, you know what, we need to look at how these crops change how much agrochemicals, how much pesticides we put in here. We need to see how they change water use, how much water they need, all long-term studies that were needed. Down here, we need to see what about loss of nutrients in the food? What about loss of nutrition? None of that was done. What about loss of diversity in seeds? Long-term studies recommended by the scientists, never done. Here, look at this. Changes in toxin or chemicals in the foods. Study recommended, long-term study, never done. So the scientists asked for these studies, said, let us do them. We think there's a problem here. We've taken a, a preliminary look. We think there's a problem. But the politicians at the FDA and, and in the administration at that time said, no. They suppressed the science. And these questions, these studies, have never been done. Never been done. The Flavor Saver tomato was the first genetically engineered food to reach the public. Calgene, the corporation that produced the tomato, had done three voluntary feeding studies on rats and found lesions in some of the rats' stomachs. The question that you're asking is, is uh, about the flavor saver tomato and what went into that. Curiously enough, I was actually one of the um, outside consultants that was in the last meeting on the flavor saver tomato, which wasn't terribly successful commercially. But um, the FDA scientist went through a long presentation about all the analyses they had done. And her concluding slide was, the flavor saver tomato is a tomato. So they had not found any substantial differences except for the addition of the one extra gene that actually decreased the rate at which they went soft, so they extended the, the shelf life. And indeed, um, that was the conclusion. So they had no reason to regulate it on the basis of, of safety. The results of the suppression of science that you see in these documents was that the FDA said to Monsanto and the other companies involved, don't worry, we don't want to see your science. We don't even ask you to do any independent science. If you think there's a problem, you come to us other, voluntarily. That's all we need to know. So this is amazing. I and mean, this is, you know, this is, imagine if we did this with drugs or we, we did this with automobiles. Oh, no, it's safe unless you, the person who's producing it, tells us there's a problem. It's called voluntary regulation. And clearly, here in other cases, it's, it's a disaster. It's not the way government should work because it means we're the guinea pigs. When you look at what happened uh, with the FDA, it wasn't just an attack on science. It was really an attack on knowledge because people had a right to know about what was in their food and a right to choose whether they wanted that food or not. And it was the active intent that they did not want people to have that knowledge and not want them to have that choice. So this isn't just a story about science. It's a story about knowledge, democracy, and freedom of choice. Good morning. Today I'm proud to join the Department of Health and Human Services in announcing a new set of reforms in the area of biotechnology and policy. The reforms we announce today will speed up and simplify the process of bringing better agricultural products developed through biotech to consumers, food processors, and farmers. We will ensure that biotech products will receive the same oversight as other products instead of being hampered by unnecessary regulation. We will not compromise safety one bit. However, as a result of these reforms, the consumer will enjoy better, healthier food products at lower prices. White House briefing on this issue at 12.30. No one gets up in the morning saying, I want to go buy a genetically engineered food. They offer no benefits. No more nutrition, no more flavor, no nothing. They only offer risks. That's all they offer to the consumer. And so the average person, of course, rational person would say, why would I buy a food that offers me no new benefits, but only risks? So it was critical, 
critical for the industry to get these foods out without anyone knowing, because if they knew, they would obviously choose not to buy them. I don't know how many years of testing you would feel comfortable with, but if I told you it was 25 years, would you feel comfortable? If I told you it was 12 years, would you feel comfortable? Six years? At what point, how many years of testing and how many different kinds of tests would make you feel comfortable? I will tell you, as, as I've said before, that because these foods are tested more than any others, any other new uh, kinds of foods that have come on the market, I am more confident about these than I am about picking up a new package of something that the ingredients of which I don't know. By allowing the biotech industry to introduce their genetically modified food on the market, the U.S. government hopes to increase exports and give the U.S. competitive advantages. So this is Bach rather upset. I mean, Bach, this is Bach in a, in a very, very feisty mood. Um, here's a, a, a beautiful piece, uh, very well known. It's a piece that Bach wrote, and it's very simple, very simple. I was about three or four years old here, and you know, I'm almost all head. I have a huge head, and uh, I guess I should have known then that I was going to be somebody who's going to spend his life writing, thinking, and talking, you know, because it seems to me that's uh, an early indication of that. So that's where I was headed. On the left here, this is my brother Alan, um, who was just a tremendous influence in my life. Alan uh, introduced me into fly fishing. And um, it was really through him that I became involved in anti-war activities as a young man and later in civil rights activities and then in the environmental movement. And what was so encouraging in those years was we were able to stop a war, help stop a war as an act of conscience. We were able to say, you know what, we're going to begin a long path towards you know, racial justice. We were succeeding. Uh, we created the environmental movement in this country. Uh, we created the feminist movement where women were finally able to say, we're going to be able to share power and, and, and have equal opportunity. So it was a very exciting time where you said, you know, if you do get involved, you can accomplish something. You know, if, if you don't like history, make history. If you don't like the news, make the news. And, and that's what we learned in that time. And I think it's been, for me, the inspiration for all the work I've done since. <laughs>